All right, let's get into single raised pots. Um, so single raised pots, we're going to have the largest stack to pot ratios, uh, roughly 16 to 1. Um, and when you have really high stack to pot ratios, a hand's value comes from its ability to make the nuts, right? Um, a single pair type hand really struggles to get to showdown in large pots. Uh, so I, I listed some flop lines that are pretty common and what that does to the turn stack to pot ratio. Uh, so as you can see, if it goes like check, check, bet one third call, you end up with a 10 to 1 turn SPR. If there's a two thirds pot bet on the flop, ends up with 7.5 to 1 SPR. And if it goes two thirds pot, 3x raise in a call, it's a 3.5 to 1 SPR. And uh, so at the bottom, we want to be thinking ahead on how, um, how we want to play turns and what size turn bet we can use to set up a river jam. Um, so at 10 to 1, you would need to bet 300% pot on the turn. At 7.5 to 1, it would be 220. And at 3.5 to 1, you would bet 80% on the turn to set up a 1 to 1 stack to pot ratio. So before we get into the solver work, uh, there's another quote I really like. Acosavedo says, the best use for GTO solvers is to analyze the recommended strategies and try to understand why the solver is choosing to play hands the way it does, incorporating the underlying GTO principles to our decision-making process instead of trying to memorize fixed strategies. In some sense, we should try to become the solver so we can determine the correct decision for ourselves. And that's exactly how we're going to approach um, our solver work. We're not looking to memorize these strategies. Uh, we just instead want to gain intuition um, and apply it to many different situations. So with that being said, let's hop into some solver work. Um, I wanted to focus our first single raise pot study on low jack open versus button flat uh, because I think that it's one of the biggest leaks I see in online cash games that people are see, oh, way over C betting out of position as the preflop raiser. Um, so in the preflop section, we talked about you know what these ranges look like. The, this button range is a condensed range, weighted heavily, you know sevens through jacks, good suited cards because the button's going to be for betting a polarized strategy. And then the low jack is um, about 17% opening range. Um, I, I did include mixed frequencies for this post-flop study. Uh, I know that like in the implementable GTO charts, we, we just move all these frequencies into 10-9 here, into 6s, um, into king-8, queen-jack. Um, but for the post-flop analysis, I wanted to uh, provide some board coverage. And so this is a true GTO strategy where we would be mixing mixing frequencies. Um, I had PyoSolver run these two ranges across a ton of different flops to create something called an aggregate report. And so instead of figuring out how do, how do we play from the low jack against the button on one specific flop of 854, it solves for how do we play across multiple types of flops. And then so we try to sort them and, and gain intuition from, from the data that we're, we're going to see uh, on the next slide. So before we get into the concepts that we can see from this data, uh, let's just kind of run through what we're looking at. So I ran the low jack um, raise first in range versus the button range across these flops. Um, and then here we can see the low jacks equity EV equity realization factor and then the button flat equity EV equity realization factor. Um, and then over here we're looking at um, flop betting frequencies. So how often is the low jack using the two thirds pop bet size? how often is the low jack using the one-third pot bet size, and how often the low jack is checking. And then similarly for the button, um, here are the betting frequencies across the same flop subset after the low jack checks. So how often is the button using the two-thirds pot bet size, one-third pot bet size, and checking. Um, so let's first look at when the low jack opens and has a large range advantage. As you can see here, out of position equity, um, these are boards where the low jack has a large range advantage, a lot of times this is going to be two big card type boards, king 10x, ace jack x, king 9x, jack 10x. Um, and when we have a large range advantage from the low jack, we're betting very frequently, and we're going to be using that small sizing. Um, obviously we have an outlier here, which we'll talk about later, on um, king 3-3. And then similarly, another outlier here, um, this is a monotone board, ace queen 7. We're going to be checking a lot, and, and we'll go through a monotone board um, in the, in the quiz section to figure out why that is an outlier. And on these same boards where um, the low jack has a large range advantage, um, when checked to, the button's really going to polarize his range. Um, you can see that there's zero, I mean, effectively 0% small bets being used. Um, and so just checking a lot from the button and using a large bet size. 
and that's because that when the low jack is checking on a board where you know he has a, a pretty substantial range advantage the most common hand type is going to be you know a marginal made hand so you know like on king 10 4 you know much of his 10x is going to check there ace 10 jack 10 queen 10 um 10 9 and so when we're betting this as the button player we want to use the large bet size um and then polarize our range around um, low jack's most common holding which is going to be those marginal made hands and then as we move down um, the table in terms of the low jack's equity we see that on like ace nine eight ace three two it's ace xx boards um, we're actually just going to be checking at a very high frequency um, i think that myself included these are boards that are misplayed by everybody but the button caller has more sets and more two pair combos on on these type hands so our hands from the low jack, like ace king, ace queen, they can't go for three streets at these stack depths um, at equilibrium. So we're just going to look to check almost our entire range on those boards. In my opinion, the most important board types to really look at um, from low jack open versus button flat is when the low jack doesn't have a range advantage, which starts right here and down, um, because it, you know, the solver very clearly shows us that when we open from the low jack and the button flats. On boards where we don't have a range advantage, which includes all 10 high flops and lower, um, we should just be checking our entire range. And it, you know, it's just it's it's a very clear strategy that the pile solver is showing us here, um, and I think it's a strategy that's pretty rare among uh, among any cash games, right? I think that people are over betting these boards, and I, I think that um, you know for a long time I was over betting these boards. So by developing a you know, fundamentally sound strategy when we don't have the range advantage in checking, it's going to allow us to uh, play better um, in these spots. And then the last thing, let's look at how um, the button plays on boards where um, the button has the range advantage. So, jack 6-4, it's, it's about 50-50, and as that happens, you start seeing the small bet used, um, and then you see some larger bets, and then some smaller bets again when it has a large range advantage. And, and what you'll see is that um, the large bet sizes are due to um, the like how connected the flop is, how many straight draws are available, um, how, how wet the board is, you know, so jack 8, 7, 10, 9, 4, 10, 8, 7. Um, so on wet boards, the button player is going to use a larger sizing. And then on all dry boards and paired boards um, where it has a range advantage or it's very close to 50-50, um, the button's going to want to use a one-third pot size. So I know that there are some frequencies here, you know, 27%, 21-17, but we can just simplify this strategy. Um, that way we can, you know, implement it easier in our games. And so I think when I'm playing in the button versus a low jack open and get checked to, on a neutral board or a board where I have a range advantage, I'm just always going to bet small on disconnected um, dry boards, and then I'm going to use the two-thirds pop bet size on wet boards. So let's look a little bit more in depth at um, some of these boards where we're supposed to be checking at 100% frequency and try to figure out why and then how to play um, after the flop. So we'll take 8-5-3 for example. This is once again low jack open versus butt flat. And let's just look at how our whole, whole range breaks down on this. We have about 70% of our range ace high and worse, um, which leaves like 30% for, you know, low to middle pairs and then a, a few nutted type hands of sets and over pairs versus the button range that although they have less combos of, of over over pairs and similar combos of sets it makes up a larger portion of their range right their range is 5.4 percent sets ours is 1.9 and they have much less junk on this board you know much less ace high king high nothing and so what that does is it leads to the button having a range advantage as we saw in the in the previous table and then the low jack should be checking 100% of his range. We're going to use the same 100% checking range um, on all similar board types, right? All 10 high boards and lower, we're just going to check our entire range. So let's look at um, what the button strategy is. So this is showing the button flop strategy after a low jack check. Um, we see a high frequency of the small bet size used. And when we're playing in the button in this in this situation, we want to simplify the strategy and only use this one third bet size. Um, I would say against probably ninety nine percent of your opponents, you can actually probably just bet range small here because people are misplaying the spot from the low jack and they're going to be over c betting eight five three, 
which is going to leave their checking range to be too weak. But at equilibrium, we should be betting about 70% here, checking 30. Um, the hands that really want to check are some ace high type hands, ace jack, ace queen. And then some of your weaker hands with no backdoor flush draw, like king queen of hearts on this board, king jack of hearts. Um, they want to bet less frequently because they pick up less equity on turns. Um, so just intuitively, let's think about what factors would cause us to want to bet less frequently than this. And um, it, it would be an odd situation, an uncommon situation, but what would happen is, imagine if the low jack opens and then always bets his air. Every time he gets air on 8-5-3, he bets, and every time he has a good made hand, he checks. So his checking range would be extremely strong, and that would make us want to polarize our betting range and have a really high frequency of checking. Let's see how we should respond in the low jack. So what we see here is a really important um, concept that's going to be used across tons of different board types. And that is that when we open from the low jack and we have a board that we don't have a range advantage on, we're all, we've all come to the first conclusion that we're going to check our entire range, right? And so because we're checking our entire range, then we get to develop a large check raising frequency because we still have nutted hands. Um, and so that's exactly what you see here. After low jack strategy, after a check, button bets one third. And this is, um, you know, the pile solver response to that strategy. We're going to be raising 25%, calling 41, and folding about a third of our range. So let's talk about how we're structuring our raising range here. Um, I think our value hands are pretty easy to find. You know, we're, we have our sets, threes, fives, and eights that prefer to raise. And then um, something interesting is how, how, we, how we play our over pairs. You know, jacks plus have a pretty large preference to raising. And then nines and tens prefer to call. And that is because when we raise jacks on this board, we're getting a lot of value from the button having nines and tens, um, whereas nines don't mind just check calling, keeping the pot a little bit smaller. Um, how we play our eights is also kind of interesting. Nine eight suited is a pure check call, um, almost pure check call. And then king eight and ace eight are mixed frequencies. And, and that's because we're getting a lot of value from um, buttons worst eight X that, that are betting here or even worse pairs that are betting for protection, that is ace five suited, um, as well as some pocket pairs. And we do have a few clear bluffs. You know, you have six, seven suited, ace two, ace four. Those are gonna be, you know, high frequency, high equity draw type hands. Um, but we kind of have to reach to find enough bluffs here. And so when we look at um, how we structure the rest of our raising range, it's a lot of our, you know, weaker ace x suited, and these are all gonna be with a backdoor flush draw. King X suited, um, and then some Jack, Queen, and King highs. Um, and, and I just think, you know, most people aren't finding those raises, right? But we can look at this grid and very easily find, you know, enough value hands that we need to find bluffs. And, and we really prefer to just check call our showdown value type hands. So if you look like Ace, Queen, Ace, King, you know, all the way down to Ace, 10, they just prefer to check call. They have a reasonable amount of showdown value. And so when we try to balance our our nutted our, our value range here and our check raise, we can just find um, our worst ace x is king, queen, jack, 10x. Make sure to have a backdoor flush draw. You want to be able to pick up equity on the turn. Um, that way you can you know have some playability against the button's continuing range. And the last thing that's kind of interesting is, you know, I think that I, I still struggle with this sometimes, but I really like to fight for pots, right? I think a lot of people like to fight for pots. And so it doesn't really, you know, feel great to just open ace check off, have the button call, flop comes eight five three, and you check fold. But you know, po poker isn't about feeling good, right? It's it's about playing well. And so you have to be disciplined and understand that the most profitable play with ace jack and king queen in, in these type hands is is just to fold them. So let's go through the most common line first, which is going to be low jack check. Um, button small bet one third and then low jack call so we have 40% here so what we have here is turn hotness um, this shows the button strategies on uh, every single turn that could that could come we're, we really just want to you know gain intuition on on why we're using certain bet sizes on the turn and I think it's pretty clear that you know an ace and king we're using this bet 42 um, and so something to note is the pot is 21. So when an ace or king come, we're never using a small bet size. Never using a small bet size. We're only over betting on an ace and a king. And that's because when we're, on, when we're in the button and when we use a small 
you know, when we use the one third pot flop size, a lot of the out of position continuing range that check called are ace axes and king axes, right? And so when those, when that card comes, it's really bad for the button range, which is going to lead to the button polarizing his range around the most common, um, the most common hand type, which is going to be top pair, right? So we want to use a very large bet size to have fold equity against that, as well as to get value um, and try to make his ace x indifferent. Whereas on jacks down, we're almost solely using this bet 14. So let's look at how Pile Solver would play against um, on an ace x turn, because I think that this is probably a branch of the game tree that most people aren't familiar with. Um, but it's kind of cool to see, right? I mean, it's, it is extremely clear that the game theory software, when an ace comes on this turn, will never use even a pot size bet. It's o only overbang. So let's look at how it structures its range and um, learn how to implement that into our game. So here is the button turn strategy with ace diamond. Once again, the pot is 21. Um, here are our action frequencies. We're going to be looking to use a 2x pot size with 30% of our range and then check about 70. And so once again, the most common low jack holding is going to be top pair. And so look at how we play our top pairs. It's, it's pretty bizarre, right? We think that like in most situations without doing the study, I would almost always bet ace queen for value here. You know, I, I can't think of not ever like, I can't imagine not betting ace queen for value here, but clearly the game theory software wants us to check our top pair and then just like really, really polarize our range using a massive bet size with most of our two pair combos, all of our sets, and then balancing it with our bluffs. Um, one thing that's interesting is you see the ace five is kind of the kind of the hand that splits, right? Ace three is a two, we have two pair, but we are pure checking here. And then ace five is mixed and ace eight is, is um, you know, pure, pure over betting. So when we think about like where we want our bluffs to come from, um, we first want to look at our backdoor flush draws. And if I sort this grid um, by only our diamond combos, look at how frequently we're using our backdoor flush draws as our bluffs. I mean, it's almost pure, like almost full frequency that we're using these backdoor flush draws. And that's because when we overbet here and the low jack player calls, we want to have a large amount of equity um, to make a nutted hand, right? We don't want to just be using king queen off here as a bluff because you know against his ace axes we have very low very low equity to a turn call but the thing is like we don't have enough backdoor flush draws to balance out our value range and so we have to find more bluffs and so um the two most you know most intuitive bluffs at this point are going to be our gut shots so pocket twos pocket fours um, five four as well, pair plus a gut shot. Um, th those make sense to bluff, uh, but the game theory, you know, pile solver is telling us that we need more bluffs. So we're actually going to use six five six eight eight seven and eight nine as bluffs because these hands are blocking our opponent's two pair combos, and very likely have five outs to improve. So this is a pretty fun spot. I think that, you know, utilizing this overbet in this spot is going to put your opponent in a nightmare situation and they're just not going to they're not going to know how to play against this bet size. So let's go through the turn call line. So say you overbet 2x and then the low jack player calls. Um, and before we before we look at that line, I want you to think intuitively what rivers could come that are going to lead to us betting very frequently. Think about what what cards could come on the river where we're going to bet very frequently. Let's look at it. So as you can see here on diamond rivers, we're betting very frequently as opposed to non-diamond rivers. About 15% more frequently in most cases. There's a lot more. And that's because our turn over bet, we were bluffing with a lot of backdoor flush draws, right? And so when a lot of our bluffing range now improves to premium made hands, it allows us to bet more hands for value, which allows us to bluff more um, and just bet more frequently. Something else to note here is that the pot is 105 and we have 149 behind. 
and I also gave Pile Solver the opportunity that it could use the half pot bed size, but Pile Solver pretty much in every situation um, wants to just utilize the all in bed size. And that's very heavily due to the fact that we polarized our range on the turn by 2xing it, um, and then we want to be able to bluff as much as possible. Um, so we need, we need to use the largest bet size, um, which is going to be that bet 149. Let's take when the diamond comes in and figure out how we want to structure our river, river betting range. So let's first look, um, once again, a reminder, we're on the turn went check, bet 2x pot call, and then now the low jack checks to us and on the 10 of diamonds river. So our backdoor flush draws now became a flush. We still have a reasonable amount of sets in two pair combos. As you can see, we have um, about 46% two pair plus, 54 top pair, and worse. Um, and so when we look to jam here, we have to think about what pot odds we're giving to the low jack on his call. As you can see, if the low jack wins 37% of the time, it's going to be profitable for him. So very clearly, we have to give up with some bluffs in our range. So let's look at how Pile Solver structures the button jamming range. As you can see, all of our flushes are jamming. Almost all of our sets are jamming. I mean, point, point 0.1 combos less. And then some of our two pair combos are jamming, which is actually just going to be ace eight um, because we, we don't have any ace ten that played this way. And then clearly, with these, you know, with our middle strength hands, you know, the top pair, we're pure checking this hand. And then we have about 36% of um, our range is going to be bluffs. And it's going to be. Know, low pair, third pair type hands mostly, and these are going to be hands that are blocking our opponent's um, sets and two pairs. So one question we need to ask is why are we not structuring our range with 63% nuts to 37% bluffs? And that's because our, the low jack player has traps, right? When we're betting even a small amount of two pair and some sets for value here, like we're going to just um, that go bet 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 with like our set of fives here even when the flush comes in well our opponent still has like eight nine of diamonds in this range he still has you know pocket eight so due to the fact that our opponent has some traps that beat our value hands we need to be a little bit more value heavy in this spot so i hope that was a fun exercise for you guys um you know this same strategy should be um implemented for all all similar flops right all these low flops 10 and under from the low jack when we open or from the but button when we're playing a low jack um, we should be using these these strategies hello everyone i'm jonathan little hope you're having a great thanksgiving i hope you're enjoying my thanksgiving day marathon and let me tell you about a course that i had made because well i play six max cash games online and they are just getting tougher and tougher and tougher and to be fair even live poker is getting tougher and tougher and tougher. So I had one of my students, just GTO, who absolutely crushes the small and medium stakes online cash games, make a pre-flop and post-flop cash game course discussing how to play pre-flops, single race pots, three bet pots, four bet pots, etc. And he provides hundreds of pile solver simulations to help you crush six max cash games against, for the most part, decently competent opponents. I actually just went to the Bahamas recently, and I decided to test what I learned from just GTO, and I did quite well in the online six-handed cash games. It was, it was great. The players were tough, but I got in there, held my own, and I even came out on top. So you can even teach an old dog new tricks, I suppose. This is actually part of Poker Coaching Premium, where you have access to over 62 poker courses just like this one. And for Black Friday, I'm giving it to you for the cheapest price we ever had. If you just want this course, it's only nine bucks. I want to get the material in your hands that you need to succeed and improve your poker skills and your life. And Just GTO will help you do that for sure if you are working to learn six-handed cash games or just how to play against reasonably strong or very strong opponents to get this course or to sign up for Poker Coaching Premium to get all the courses, head over to pokercoaching.com slash Black Friday right now. Happy Thanksgiving.